So it's good to be back at AUSA, I must admit. Uh, coming into the building today, I was thinking, we have been on a journey now for the past decade as an Army. And while Steve uh, indicated that certainly I can talk about the priorities of U.S. Cyber Command and the priorities of the National Security Agency, what I thought I'd do today is to remind us where we've been on this journey as an Army. Because it has been 10 plus years. And I would say, even though we can talk about persistent engagement, our ability to both enable our partners and to act, it's really important for us to take the lessons learned of what we've been able to do as an Army. Because today, if you take a look at the environment upon which we operate, where our adversaries continue to be increasingly pervasive, are increasingly capable, you know, what are they doing? They're operating below the level of armed conflict with the idea of stealing our intellectual property, eroding our military overmatch, stealing our personally identifiable information, which certainly gets at our confidentiality and attempting to interfere within our democratic processes. But this morning what I'd like to do, and I certainly would appreciate both uh, Pat and Guy's uh, ability for me to kind of squeeze in this morning over a, a fairly significant series of meetings that I'm headed to today, but what I would like to, to talk about is, so what's the Army done to be able to defend our interests in cyberspace? How have we been able to impose costs against our adversary? And how have we learned the lessons over the past 10 years that really have projected us forward? Now what I would offer today is a story of how the Army has built, trained, and deployed this force and continues to build a powerful force for the future is the idea of really three central things that we have focused on. First of all, this idea of building both a school and a branch. Now, ladies and gentlemen, 10 years ago I would offer that those discussions were far from settled, they were friction-laden, and there was a tremendous amount of angst in terms of what do we do with this new idea of cyberspace? But our ability as a service to go after and look at let's build a school, let's build a branch, has been able and has allowed us to make sure that our young people are able to look at cyber and say, hey, I have a career within this force. I can one day enter as an E1 and become an E9, or one day I can come in as a young lieutenant and someday be the commander of U.S. Army cyberspace. Or I can come in as a warrant officer and be able to apply my trade. And remember, central to this conversation early on was this idea of, hey, I want to come in and I want to work cyber. I don't necessarily want to work Intel. I don't necessarily want to work Signal. I don't want to necessarily work another branch. I want to be within cyberspace. So that's point one. Second piece is this idea of we need a training platform. How do we train the force? I came in in the mid-80s. Yes, the mid-80s. It was a great decade. And I thought about my first rotation to the National Training Center and what a difference that made in our capabilities to look at our force, see ourselves, execute what we were supposed to do, and prepare for future conflict. We're doing that same idea today in cyberspace. And we'll talk a little bit about the persistent cyber training environment, the importance of what this capability is going to bring to what we do. And the final thing I would say is, what's an army without doctrine? What's an army without doctrine and strategy? Uh, that's among the things that we have foundationally done within cyberspace, is ensure that we have a doctrine and a strategy that allows us to have a foundation for what we're going to do. So we are in a renewed area of great power competition. Our army is going to be called and has already been called on to act within this new domain. But we are no longer building a force. We're no longer preparing and shaping a force. We, are now, we now have a force that acts. We have a force that is every single day defending our networks. We have a force that is running our, our networks and not only running them well, but also taking a look at the full spectrum piece of what Steve has talked to in terms of how do we impose cost against an adversary? And how do we do that necessarily in support of a joint force commander in places like Iraq and Afghanistan? Or how do we do it in terms of being able to support a national objective like the midterm elections? So let's talk a little bit about where we've been, where we are, and where I think we're leading to. So let me provide, first of all, just a current baseline of our force. Let's look at DOD information network operations. Okay, as Steve mentioned, 90% of what we do, I would offer as the commander of U.S. Cyber Command, a majority of what I think about every single day is how do we secure our networks? How do we secure our data? 
How do we ensure the security of our weapon systems? Now within the Army, obviously, Network Enterprise Technology Command under the command of Major General Maria Barrett, headquartered at Fort Huachuca, is our instrumental force in terms of our headquarters being able to do Doden operations. The 1.2 million endpoints that NETCOM has responsibility, working that in coordination with our higher headquarters, Army Cyber Command, but importantly, working it across the services. Because when we see vulnerabilities, when we see risks, when we see intrusions in one service, it rapidly moves laterally. And this idea of being able to run a network really well, the idea of being able to have a global placement, as does NETCOM with eight brigades in 21 different countries. This is, as Steve mentioned, is foundational of what we do. And this ability to have the assurance, to have the reliability, and have the operational capability to run a network is sometimes easier said and easily than done. But I would tell you we do that very well, and I've watched it over the period of 10 years, growing in terms of our ability to not only look at vulnerabilities, react to vulnerabilities, but more importantly, get in front of those vulnerabilities. Now, closely followed by Dodon operations, this idea of defensive cyberspace operations. Today, 20 different cyber protection teams in our force. Looking at ensuring and, and being able to not only provide hunting capabilities on our network because these cyber protection teams, the number one thing that they're going to do is hunt for an adversary. And how do they hunt for an adversary? They hunt for an adversary because they have exquisite intelligence. And as Steve mentioned, where does that exquisite intelligence come from? Whether or not it's Intelligence and Security Command, whether it's National Security Agency, whether or not it's self-generated, this idea of being able to have a cyber protection team, 20 of these teams, of which seven that are looking at our Army systems, is critical what we do for the future. It is also one of the areas over the past decade that I would say has changed perhaps the most. This idea of being able to take a very, very small element, deploy them forward, being able to establish a reach back element in the United States, and then being able to track and hunt and report on an adversary. This was done exquisitely in the midterm elections with three different elements being able to move forward into Europe. This is what is different about our defensive space, our defensive cyberspace operations today. This idea of being able to deploy forward, be able to project your power, being able to work with a partner nation to say, hey, we have capability, we know that our adversaries are within your network, and let's identify them. Now, not only are we building 20 teams within our active component, but the Army Reserve and the Army Guard, 21 different teams. They are starting to come online today, and if you take a look at the, the reporting across uh, the, across the press over the past several weeks and past several months. Look at the ransomware attacks in places like Louisiana, in Texas, in Montana, and the governor's calling out whom? Calling out the guard to be able to do this. This is a new venue, this is a new capability, this is a new possibility for what we're doing to build this capacity across our total army force. As we move to defense, let's move to offense very quickly in terms of this is, as many would imagine, the focus for, for many conversations. What are we going to do offensively? We have 21 different teams in our Army. Those 21 different teams, whether or not they're located in places like Georgia or Texas or Hawaii or Fort Meade, they provide options to Joint Force Commanders. They provide options to me in defense of the nation. There are highly trained 1,100 people that have come on board over the past several years. These 21 teams provide us, literally, the capability to provide force projection to deployed commanders every single day in Iraq and Afghanistan. But behind all of these teams are the command and control apparatuses that are so important for us to be able to get things done. Whether or not it's Army Cyber Command, whether or not it's Joint Force Headquarters Cyber, in Fort Gordon, as I mentioned, NETCOM or the 780th that has responsibilities for our force, our offensive force. First IO Command. If we take a look at full spectrum operations, where does information operations fit in? It fits in very, very cleanly with regards to what we want to do in EW, Cyber, and IO. And then, of course, the Army Cyber Protection Brigade headquartered at Fort Gordon, Georgia. And you say, what's the investment that we've made as an Army? We make an investment a little less than $2 billion per year for our cyber force. And I would tell you it returns much more every single year in terms of its capabilities and its options and its response times. 
I highlighted in my opening remarks this idea of three components that have really been successful for us as an army as we built this force. Let's talk about that first component, this idea of building a branch and a school. In fact, we really built the school and I stood up the school before we stood up the branch. What's been our success over the past five years? Let me share with you those successes. Right now we have been able to, since 2015, train over 332 officers at Fort Gordon. We started with a class of 16 several years ago. We have built it under the leadership of Fogarty and Morrison and now Hersey and a tremendous amount of capability brought in by TRADOC to go from 16 to well over 300 and we're looking at 400 officers a year in the near future. So 300 plus commissioned officers that come in. In the future, 200 officers a year we will anticipate we will train at Fort Gordon. But it's not only commissioned officers, let's take a look at the warrant officers. Over 100, 100 have been, been trained since 2015 and now on a pathway for 50 a year as we move out. Then the 17 Charlies are enlisted force. Well, over 250 have been trained over the past several years, moving towards again a goal of 400 per year. What we've been able to do though is take a look at Fort Gordon in a much different light in terms of being able to build the capacity at our cyber school. And I suspect that General Hersey will be able to talk about this later, but what I see is this ability to rapidly bring the lessons of what we learn in our force to the schoolhouse rapidly. Every day we're changing in terms of how we conduct our defensive operations. How do we ensure that the defensive hunting techniques that we're doing in a forward deployed location rapidly get back into the cyber center of excellence. We're doing that today. And oh, by the way, how do we ensure that young people that come through and have had the ability uh, to grow in this domain for many years aren't necessarily going through the same process that we went through at the basic courses of years ago, where we train necessarily not to standard, but certainly to time. The other piece I would offer, and I'm very, very proud of the fact, is that the cyber center of excellence has also taken a look at how do we ensure that we have some type of equivalency and some type of manner to work with our reserve components? National Guard and Reserves can't necessarily come back to Fort Gordon for six months of training. But a very, very highly skilled force that's able to ensure that they meet the equivalencies, why are we not ensuring that that would be the standard for the future? So that's the first part as we take a look at our, our schoolhouse. But the other part behind it is the branch. You know, the fact that we have a cyber branch, the fact that we've taken a look and said, hey, this is so important to us that we are the newest branch since SF at the mid-80s. That's taken off in terms of being able to take a look at the culture, the capacity, the ability to bring an idea to this new branch, the ability, as I mentioned, for young people to look at and say, hey, I'm going to start out as a cyber officer or as a cyber enlisted soldier, and I'm going to continue my career throughout that whole period of time. Incredibly important to us. Now, if branch and school are the first two elements, let me talk about the second element, which is how do we train? As I alluded to, a foundational impact upon me was this idea of early in my career going to the National Training Center and being able to experience an after action review. Seeing the ability for us to plan something, synchronize something, and then hopefully execute something. That's the same idea we're pursuing now in cyberspace. How do we take the concept of a persistent cyber training environment, a virtual NTC-like commodity, and bring it to places like Meade and Gordon and Texas and Hawaii? What does that allow us to do? It allows a young squad leader, allows a young team leader to come in and rerun a scenario. Hey, we want to hunt on a certain network. Let's go ahead and build that network to scale. Let's ensure that that network is exactly like the network we're going to hunt on, and then let's train. What do we do so well as an army? We train. We train to standard. We train to an ability to get to an outcome. This is the same idea that we are pursuing with regards to the persistent cyber training environment. And oh, by the way, this idea of doing after action reports is not lost on those of us that have grown up in the army doing that. So how do we bring the same concept of experiential learning to a virtual reality upon which we operate? So important to us. And then, if you're an offensive team, how do you actually take a look at the network that you're going to have to access, move through, and then get to some type of effect at an end state? How do we do that? How do we ensure that 
We are looking at every single angle in terms of what we want to do. We can't do that in real life, but we certainly can do it within the concept of a persistent cyber training environment. This, ladies and gentlemen, for us will be among the most important items that will come on board in the next six to 12 months that will drive our readiness. We see it so clearly. We see it from the young teams that have already operated within this space, and we see the ability for them, again, to bring their teams down, to do the individual, and most importantly, that collective training that's so important to us as an Army. And then finally, as I mentioned, what's an Army without doctrine and out strategy? Joint Pub 312 guides us for cyberspace operations. The Army has already written their field manual, Field Manual 312, that looks at this. But the interesting thing about where we're going as an Army today is this idea of how do we take a look at not only what we're going to do for the Joint Force, not only what we're going to be able to do in support of combatant commands like U.S. Cyber Command, but how do we operate at the Brigade Combat Team and below? How do we ensure that the information operations, the capabilities upon which we impact social media, how do we take a look at these early lessons learned that cyberspace teams that have already deployed with Brigade Combat Teams to the National Training Center and Joint Readiness Training Center are going to be able to leverage that? We've written that down. We've been able to capture it, this idea of a cyberspace army for our army, a cyberspace strategy for our army, this idea of an integrated framework of intel, cyber, EW, and IO. Critical pieces of where we need to go. What Steve Fogarty has talked about for several months is now part of what we're talking about in our doctrine. In the early stand-up of a cyber warfare support battalion at Fort Gordon that brings together the ideas of information operations and EW and cyber, there's no longer an idea. It's based upon the foundational strategy, and it's actually a unit that's operating today. So those three components, whether or not it's a branch in school, whether or not it's training, whether or not it's strategy and doctrine, what has it led to? Well, let's take a look at the report card over the past 10 years. First service to build, to standard, 41 different teams across all of the Department of Defense, the United States Army. Secondly, when we were looking at Joint Task Force Ares, the stand-up of a capability to go against ISIS offensively, who did U.S. Cyber Command point to? Army Cyber Command. Every single day as we take a look at operations in Afghanistan, in Iraq, and other places within Central Command, Leveraging the capabilities of Army Cyber. And that's not only the teams, but it's also the capabilities that have been, that have been uh, developed over the past decade. What Intelligence and Security Command has done early on has now been leveraged for us in being able to create effects in and through cyberspace. And the last thing, the midterm elections of 2018. Among the key players, an Army team that was able to get onto net and provide effects in support of the defense of our midterm elections. So those are the results that we've had with a very, very small amount of investment. But the important thing is that we've been able to bring together our strengths. We've been able to bring together our strengths of leadership. We've been able to bring together our strengths of other Army commands that have been able to support us, whether or not it's been Force Com or Training and Doctrine Command, Army Material Command. We've approached this as an Army in terms of seeing the future and understanding how important this is not only to our service, but the nation. But ladies and gentlemen, I'd be remiss to say we're on a journey, and we've been on a journey for the past decade. And as U.S. Cyber Command gets ready to celebrate its 10-year anniversary next spring, I think we can safely say that our adversaries will continue to operate below the level of armed conflict, that they will continue to operate with speed and agility, and that they will continue to adapt to this change. But for that, our Army must be as resilient and as ready as we've always been. And so as we look at cyberspace today, I'm left very, very pleased with the idea that we will continue to make, for many years, a contribution. A contribution in supporting our Army, supporting our Joint Force, and supporting our combatant commands. And so with that, I would close by saying, the best is truly yet to come. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I appreciate it.